Coming up on Virginia Currents, find out how Deshaun Wright used an abusive relationship to be his motivation to rise up and inspire many. Also, join us in a time travel to the past with enthusiastic educator and entertainer Lamar Bannister. And check out Field Day of the Past, a glance at a 25-year tradition in Goochland, plus the true-to-life portraits of David Tanner during his visit to Daphne's Corner, and the passionate music of the Bobby Black Hat Band, coming up on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed. In this world, there are two kinds of people, those who let life's hardships bring them down and keep them down, and those who are able to find a ladder of motivation to climb out of the well of despair, like Deshaun Wright of Yorktown. Deshaun went from being in an abusive relationship and homeless to now being a champion bodybuilder, owner of three gyms, a host of the Convocation Radio Talk Show, a motivational speaker, a community outreach organizer and activist, and was named York County's Citizen of the Year in 2015. This father of two tells us about his incredible journey. James Brown says this, a person's pain lies their success. Either lies their success, or it allows their downfall, one of the two. That's how you handle it. Could pain, could mold you or fold you. Knees up, knees up, knees up. God's gift to you, you is your life. What I do with it is my gift back to him. Good. Good. Uh, First of all, what got me into um, bodybuilding is my dad. You know, as a son, your father's your, your hero. And then he got my oldest brother. He got my oldest brother involved with bodybuilding. I didn't want to be involved. I, I hated working out. Like, I despise it. He's always trying to get me working out. I, just, I despise it. But then eventually, one day, coming from school, he's like, you want to come? And I finally went, and then I was just hooked. Like, it just took off from there. And then from there, it went into, you know, wanting to have my own gym. It was a goal of mine before I turned 30. It happened, and then the rest has been history. I had two bouts of homelessness. So the first time it came about, it was from a, um, a bad relationship that I was in. I was actually, like, um, living with somebody. Um, it was a bad relationship, and uh, it was abusive. And she was a woman. And then um, got into a big argument about some, you know, it's always some silly. And then next thing you know, she hauled off and like, when I mean hit me, like hit me, hit me, not, you know, pity pat. Like, it was like she hit me, hit me. As a man, it's always the other way around, you know? Like, man, you feel like, what? Your girl hit you? You know? So, I mean, you just, you feel like a sucker. I mean, you feel a pawn, whatever words you want to feel. But it happens to a lot of men. And then they're like, who's going to believe him? And they're going to believe him. I mean, I'm not nowhere near the size I am today that I was then. But still, I was about 230, you know what I mean, 240. So, I mean, a cop would have been like, that's what you're thinking, you know, you know what I'm saying? You're thinking like, what? Like, she hits you, and so you kind of don't, they don't speak about it. And um, I think more of us got to be vocal about it to let us know that just one-sided that it happened, because it happens to a lot of it. And um, it was just, I mean, it was, it was a bad situation, but I learned a lot from that situation. So that's, um, that's why men don't speak about it, because it just, we're, we're taught that that's a weakness. Sharing your feelings is a weakness. Expressing something wrong, that's a weakness, which is not, though. Which is not. It's totally not, man. And that ended up, like, obviously us breaking up and doing that. But I was staying with her because I gave up so much to actually be with her. And I ended up, like, actually, like, the gym I was working part-time, I ended up, like, staying there. And, uh, but that time I grew so much from staying there went at that gym and when I was homeless and because um, it was a down period. Like, I couldn't get no lower. You know, you know, when you, you know, I tell people you can't appreciate the top until you feel the bottom. And being down there so much, I mean, I grew from that and uh, it made me realize I don't want to go back there, you know? And then two, it made me be more compassionate and empathetic with people. And then the second bout of homelessness is was actually the opportunity for me to, to get the gym. I was a personal trainer, I was doing really well, and uh, I got myself back on my feet. But um, the opportunity for the gym arose. I couldn't afford to pay for the gym and where I was living too at the same time. So I had to make a decision, you know what I mean? And um, I read up on how like Tyler Perry and like Jamie Foxx had similar situations and then they gave up that comfort to go after their dream. 
and then I have two kids, I have a son and a daughter, you know what I mean? And then we lived in the gym for months, you know what I mean? <laughs> Looking at TV, you know, I'm taking them to school. I'm so close to my kids today because of that time, you know? They seen their daddy like this, and to see him become the person I am today. So that's what happened from there. Good to be back, good to see you again. Great to be back in the studio. I see, you got a little man with you today too in the studio. I didn't go through that to keep it to myself. So I want to show my story to other people who go through similar things to be like, wow, man, yo, if D could do it, then I can do it. You know, so that's the whole point of why I tell them my story, expressing it is I'm very, very important. Good job. 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 Anybody who's going through a tough situation let you know. Say somebody come and knocks me off this chair right now. Whose fault is it for knocking me off this chair? It's their fault. True. But if I stay down here and they come back next week, at the same time, I'm still on the floor. Whose fault is that now? It's my fault for not getting up. Life is going to hit you, but you can't let it keep you down. So that's what this journey has done for me. It's made me into this a person I never thought I would be. It's taught me, you know, how to be a better man, a better father, friend, to be more of a leader, more vocal in the community, and somebody to be a pillar for um, other young people who's coming up who look just like me. You know what I mean? and want to do more, and to show them that you can do more. And, um, you know, not to be a statistic. Because I set goals and because I wasn't afraid to go after them, I made me the person I am today. Through Body by D, over two dozen teens have been awarded college athletic scholarships. For more on Deshaun, his outreach, and the gym, go to Body by D Gym. Dot com. Virginia Currents TV programs can be seen anywhere, anytime at ideastations.org slash Virginia Currents. And to hear Virginia Currents radio stories, visit ideastations.org slash Radio Currents. Whether it's throwing flaming tomahawks, shooting a rifle backwards, or playing handmade instruments of centuries past, Lamar Bannister uses eye-catching ways to make history unforgettable. While he presents the past in character, Lamar's own past has been one of adventure and variety. It includes establishing one of the first independent living facilities for the mentally challenged with his wife Marjorie, running a Christian school for kindergarten through 12th graders, counseling incarcerated youth, walking on high steel girders, and helping blow up the James Riverbed to build the Poe White Parkway Bridge. Now recently, we caught Lamar in action at Lloyd C. Byrd High School in Chesterfield, where he teaches, and during the longest continuous one-man Wild West medicine show at the Field Day of the Past in Goochland County. Come one, come all. It is the last one-man Wild West medicine show in history. Where we are right now is the Field Days of the Past. Uh, people come to see antique engines, heritage, village, uh, camp, camps, frontiersman skills, a, a lot going on here, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful event for the family. What is that? A raven beauty. Step up, ladies and gentlemen, come one, come all, Dr. J's Wild West Medicine Show. At My uh, wife's grandparents met at the medicine show here in Richmond. The frontiersman skills were very important to the frontiersmen during the medicine show. The history of the medicine show covers the history of America, 1840 to 1940. And uh, the, primarily the people, the showmen would go around and uh, sell whatever tonic, anything they could, and any way to draw a crowd. What I'm going to do is I'm going to Play bones on one hand, harmonica on the other, and I'm going to try to tap dance, but I'm going to need a snort of Dr. J's to be able to pull it off. Woo! Yeah, they actually had Indian, really uh, authentic Indian cures. Uh, Sometimes the cures were even better what the doctors were doing, very often. Uh, but then there were some uh, snake oil, 
situations and they would likely try to stay into a town without sheriffs uh, so that they didn't get drummed out. A little uh, Epsom salts, a little uh, black draft laxative, 48% moonshine. So it's a good spring tonic that perks you up and cleans you out. Uh, uh, our, our American medicine show starts and then it begins to accumulate from a one-man show all the way to you get a, a Wild West show and then you have uh, 28 horses and you have plays. So the How to Call Medicine show turns into these, this major in industry which is entertainment. And so these people later on become famous in, in the entertainment and they were doing uh, dancing and different kinds of programs. Judy Garland, Bing Crosby, Red Skelton. As I think of the past. Terry, people started reading the, the uh, book about slavery and a lot of people up north had never recognized that this was really going on. The medicine shows start showing, when they're going up north, they start showing these complete productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. People were enraged, they could not believe, they're saying this really happens down south. And so Abraham Lincoln said that, that the, the medicine shows and the, uh, her story has helped start the Civil War, thanks to the medicine show. Two! What has challenged me is every time I do something, I always think, what could I do more? If I was able to do that, could I do this? Okay, here we go. Young people watching, I want them to see when I get older, I can be full of joy. I can have adventure. Uh, I can work till I can't do it anymore. Uh, and just drink in life. Elbow to elbow, lots of settlers on this ship. I had a history teacher once said, we are going to study page 233, turn. And I thought I never want to be that person. And so I've always wanted to teach history with a passion. So I have lots of artifacts that I make. And this is the hurdy-gurdy. This is the hardest thing I've made. Uh, very mechanical. This was made to sound like a drum, a bagpipe, and a fiddle all at the same time. Uh, I have antique things. I have uh, very, very in instruments, uh, some, some 150 years old or, or more. And I play the, I perform on these or I pass them around. I have primary documents that I pass around. I have a map by Captain John Smith a remarkable map. Now when you're looking at this, this is the Virginia Sea, we now call the Atlantic, and in our, our administration uh, uh, felt like it actually helps to enrich their, their scores, uh, their testing scores, and make exper uh, the experience real. So what happens is all of the social studies pr uh, programs that can and they want to, they come to the auditorium and uh, so they get to experience a different side of history. And nine ships came from England Tons, we don't know how many people, hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, they got shipwrecked. And they wreck on this island called Bermuda. And we think that Shakespeare was using this as part of his theme for the tempest. The ship's starting to split up, and you hear in the background they're crying, Mercy on us! We, we split. split! We split! Farewell, my wife! The ancient storytellers all of that hasn't changed. We just call them history teachers now. You want them to hear the way it used to be. And then whether they think about what they went through, how did you make it? How did you do it? How did you get through that? John Wolfe lost his wife and his ba baby while they were shipwrecked on this. So you know he was broken hearted. He comes up here and he carries with him something that nobody knows where he got it from. He's got Spanish tobacco seeds. You can't have Spanish tobacco seeds. It's punishable by death if you are, are found with it. Nobody knows how he got it, but he did have it. And he had an idea. And so he brought that here, and John Rolfe comes up with this tobacco. And this is the real tobacco. You're looking, you're going to be holding the, the, one of the great-great-great-great-grandchildren uh, of the tobacco that started and made Virginia famous. Uh, and there was a little girl running around here, right where you are sitting, and her name was Matoka. Okay? A little, one of her nicknames was Little Mischief. She was a little girl. 
She did not fall in love with John Smith. He was like in his 30s. That's just a bunch of bunk. Pocahontas, Matoica, and when she m married John Rolfe, she was Rebecca, but she had a Christian name. So I get a joy out of letting people see how every generation has joy. Every gen generation has to push through very hard things, and every generation makes decisions whether they're going to do it right or do it wrong. John Newton wrote that he was a slaver, slave trader, and uh, it was only the grace of God, you know, he said, that uh, got him out of it. And so that song came from a slaver who turned against it. And then he helped Wilberforce over in England. He helped him defeat it. So the first place where they stopped slavery was in England. Oh. Start County, one. Two, the joy three, that I get four. from it is to see some of the passion that I have spill over on them, that they learn, watching them smile. And it, uh, it causes them to appreciate history more and see that it's not just a subject, it's part of life. Right there, and look at my eyes. Do my muscles hurt? Do my bones hurt? Yes, they all hurt, but what it does is it makes me stay in shape so I can do this. And uh, uh, I'll keep doing this as long as I can and as long as people will have me here to tell the story. The day of this show's first airing, Lamar turns 65 years young. Happy birthday, Lamar. For more on his living history presentations, visit PassportsToHistory.com. Also, if you're curious about the next Field Day of the Past, check out FieldDayOfThePast.net. Since 1992, this festival has grown from attracting 5,000 attendees to drawing about 40,000 people. Held for three days in September, it benefits local charities and showcases things like antiques in machinery and transportation, local history, tractor pulls, horse shows, rides, awesome food, music, and even nail-biting pig races. Number two's in the lead, number one in the second, number three's in third. Number two's still in the lead, number one's trying to move on the outside. Coming down Sterling, number two slows out again. Number one passes him. Uh oh! Uh oh, it's gonna be number one by a snail! Number one. The audiences are getting younger and younger. Yes, sir. They appreciate power. And I could cry for the time it wasted. But that's a waste of time and tears, oh yeah. And I know just what I'd change if I went back in time somehow. Welcome to Daphne's Corner. Now joining us today is David Tanner. David's an oil painter from Richmond and has been creating beautiful paintings for over a decade. His travels around the world inspire the beauty captured in his paintings. He is a graduate of VCU where he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Now David has won numerous awards both locally and internationally and he teaches oil painting at the Visual Arts Center of Richmond where in the past he was elected master teacher. In Richmond his work can be seen at the Crossroads Arts Center and at his museum district studio. Welcome David, <laughs> so nice to have you, you here. Thank you. Did you always know you wanted to be a painter? Yes, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I uh -huh. didn't know exactly what that would look like, but when I was introduced to oil painting um, at VCU, it, it stuck and I, I, I really enjoyed it. I knew that that would be my medium. Ah, uh, and what other mediums do, did you dabble in before then? Uh, we were introduced to a lot of different things, pen and ink, acrylic, um, maybe a little sculpting, mm -hmm. but the, the oil paint really seemed like the right thing. What about the oil painting do you like over the other media? Uh, because I'm a representational painter and I'm trying to paint things as they appear to us, I like the fact that so much of that is trial and error, of course, mm -hmm. and trying things out and refining. Oil stays wet for a long time, and so it allows you to kind of make mistakes, correct them, refine them. And in making these mistakes and refining them, would you c take us through your process of developing, say, a painting like this? Sure, sure. Well, a painting like this or any of the ones that I brought with me today began with an idea. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about, um, I, you know, I'll see things in my everyday life that I'm attracted to. Light and color really attract me. Mm -hmm. And so the human figure attracts me. And so when I see people in my everyday life and I see, 
you know, figures on a sunny day and they're backlit. And I think, gosh, that's beautiful. Then I start to think, how could I work that into a painting? Mm -hmm. So how do you start? How do I start? Well, often I will um, work with a camera in order mm -hmm. to work out compositional ideas. Um, I also do a lot, I've studied extensively from life and I work from life on a regular basis. And it's very important for a painter to work from life. Even if they're utilizing photographs, your eye sees things that the camera doesn't. Right. Okay, But the camera can be a very valuable tool in working out compositions. And so this, as an example, was uh, the culmination of probably a hundred photographs of my models, which is my niece and her children, um, at a laundry line, at a clothesline, that I remembered from my childhood, actually, okay. and just how magical that could be with the light shining through it. Um, and we tried just different gestures. You know, the, 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 the mother holding the, uh, the clip, holding the child in a different arm. You know, the little girl did that by accident and I happened to catch it <laughs> with the camera. Inspired. And inspired, exactly. Wonderful. What other influences did you have in uh, your painting journey? Mm -hmm. Well, I was not really exposed to a lot of traditional painting technique when I was at college. And so after I uh, left school, I tried to teach myself and, you know, got pretty far and was doing some portrait commissions for a while. My mm -hmm. work was, was strong enough to do that. But I knew I needed some traditional training and particularly training from life, which I didn't have. And so I sought out teachers in, in small painting schools uh, around the country to work with in workshops and small settings. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um, we're going to back up just a little bit mm -hmm. in developing this I understand that you start small mm -hmm. and then grow do you test it out in a smaller scale yeah that's a great way to describe it and sometimes those are referred to as thumbnails and mm -hmm. so this is a thumbnail for a future painting that will probably be about the size of one of these mm -hmm. but um, in working with the model um, I arranged the scene photographed the model with a lot of different gestures this is a model holding a, a, a bowl he's actually whisking mm -hmm. some eggs and when I talked about light earlier, I loved the fact that there was a window in this setting. I could backlight the figure, not, like, uh, not unlike here, and it just makes a beautiful silhouette with the figure. And, um, but working out something small just gives me an idea without, a ho the, you know, without going into a huge extent of painting and realize, right. gosh, I wish I had designed it differently. Right. I can do this relatively fast. And how many of those do you do before you get to the big one? Golly, this is probably my third little sketch. And I think I'm ready to paint. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready to paint. I ordered a canvas and everything. So. Okay, now what accomplishment are you most proud of? Um, like I said earlier, there are a lot, well, the painters that I sought out, there, there are, there's a growing number of traditional painters around the country right now. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see the resurgence of interest in representational yes. painting. And it's long overdue. And um, there are peers on a national level who um, I've admired their work for a long time. And the fact that they know my work now is really exciting. Oh. And um, I was on the cover of American Artist in 2012, a self-portrait. Congratulations. And yeah, thank you. It's that was beautiful. a huge honor. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much thank for joining you. us today, David. And to find out more about his work, please go to davidtannerfineart.com. <laughs> You'll be amazed at that website. It's oh. it just do beautiful work. Oh, I'm so you. happy that you joined us thank today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Today's Spotlight on Virginia Music shines on the Bobby Black Hat Band from Hampton Roads. The band's founder is the award-winning recording artist, vocalist, harmonica player, and blues songwriter Bobby Black Hat Walters. After retiring from the Coast Guard, during which he served in the White House under President Clinton, Bobby Black Hat got hooked on the blues, formed the band, and has since released five CDs. His songs are often about his family. That includes his wife, five kids who are also musicians, and his five grandkids. Bobby has won numerous awards as seen on the screen. Here now is a clip of Blues Story performed at the Orpheum Theater in Memphis, where the band was a finalist in the 2016 International Blues Challenge. Thank you for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed.
Everybody has a blue story. Him, her, and me. From the day you were born to the day you go to glory. Everybody has a blue story. Everybody has a blue story. 